But first, let's start from the beginning. November 15th, 2001. The original Xbox is released in North America. In the years leading up to the launch of Microsoft's debut console, the top of the gaming food chain was controlled by Sony and Nintendo. Leading the market with machines like Super Nintendo, N64, Game Boy, PlayStation, and, within the year prior, the almighty PlayStation 2! Despite the stranglehold that Microsoft had on the personal computer market, Bill Gates and co. had some stiff competition in the gaming bazaar. The debut Xbox was the first home gaming console released by an American company since 1996 with the collapse of the Atari Jaguar. Where did you learn to fly? Conceived of by a core of engineers within Microsoft's DirectX team, the Xbox was built to offer developers a more user-friendly scaffolding to build their games upon. The marketing train set off, and gamers around the world were hyped like a bunch of dorks. Like I was. Shh. But no matter the corporate clown show of The Rock in his dumb indoor sunglasses, or Bill in his sandwiches, the average gamer didn't care about application programming interfaces, front side bus, or the 64 megabytes unified DDR ST RAM. Ah! What we wanted to know was, what are the games going to be like? I'm buying up all the farmland. <laughs> I'm the Slayer, and you're history. Oh, you're the Slayer. The opening lineup of original Xbox games, like all console launches, was a mixed bag. On one hand, you have the title that literally sold the console. And the usual heaps of shit. <sighs> anyway. Halo Combat Evolved was Bungie and thus Microsoft's answer to the world's question about what this new console and its big dumb controller brought to the table. In the wake of Halo's continued success, plenty of fun little diversions graced the Xbox with titles like Fusion Frenzy, and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X, being fun to pop in from time to time. And as notable as Halo's success was for the upstart gaming brand, the Xbox needed more than one title to give it legs. Sandwiches. Hailing from the frozen north of Montreal, Quebec, was the little studio that could Ubisoft, Montreal. Good name, Good name guys. guys! While their teeth chattered and the chill kept their French-Canadian nipples pointy, the studio was cooking up what would become the Xbox's next killer app. A game that turned heads at retailers all over. A game that helped evolve video games from a greasy basement-dwelling stereotype into a respectable medium for experiencing art firsthand. That game was Splinter Cell.
released in North America on November 17, 2002, and shortly thereafter in the EU, Splinter Cell instantly made a massive impression. Running on the Unreal Engine 2.0, the same engine that games like Bioshock were built on top of, Splinter Cell was the game that people used to show off the power of their shiny new Xbox. I still vividly remember my brother bringing over his console just to show off the game's graphics. Suffice it to say, it absolutely astonished me. Lighting and shadows were practically photorealistic, cloth physics were amazing, and the art design screamed near-future, high-speed, low-drag style. It was sleek, cool, and impressive. Not everything is held up, Jesus! but this game still has moments of beauty 20 years later. And the charm of outdated gaming engines never gets old. Now, Splinter Cell has the usual gadget, ammo, and health icons, which is well and good. As you can see here, we have access to our lockpicks, first aid kits, and weapons. But what instantly separated Splinter Cell's gameplay and the series protagonist, Sam Fisher, from its stealth action counterparts like Metal Gear Solid 2 and Hitman 2, Silent Assassin, is the light meter. Seen here, this little box gives you the ability to determine how much camouflage the environment itself gives you. If the line is in the white, you're completely exposed. All the way in the dark green, you're totally cloaked. This was a revelation in the genre, so much so that it directly influenced the camouflage index in Metal Gear Solid 3, as well as the character index in Manhunt. On the topic of darkness, the capability to stalk your prey and anticipate their movements before pouncing was cutting edge at the time, and is still as thrilling today as it was 20 years ago. Though the series and the stealth genre blossomed in the succeeding years, I still get such joy from the simple loop of taking my hostage and knocking him out with a well-placed pistol whip, donning night vision goggles, clinging to the walls, shimmying from gutters high above the ground, hanging from overhead pipes, flipping light switches, or just shooting them for permanence. And my personal favorite, performing a jump split hammer fist, like my boy, Jimmy the King. It's still fulfilling luring baddies in with a soda can or knocking them out with a big greasy liquor bottle to the forehead. Then there's the tea bag. Are you drunk? Yes, but listen. Traversing the sneaky sandbox is simple but beautifully layered. Fisher's ambulation is divided simply between an upright gait pattern and crouch walking. Crouch walking, naturally, is for keeping a low profile and creeping up on unsuspecting foes. Walking upright isn't totally necessary, but you can do it. Running around upright will get you around quicker, but if you're trying to be stealthy, this is like putting sleigh bells on your genitals, also known as Thursday. <laughs> Additionally, for some reason, you can roll around. Okay, why not? Then there is the lock picking mechanism, a mechanic often imitated, never duplicated. Simply rotate the right thumbstick until your controller vibrates and hold that spot until the pin tumbler pops. Unlock the correct amount and you're in. So simple, so satisfying. Other gameplay mechanics included using an officer for his eyes to pass a retinal scanner check and listening in on secret conversations via the directional microphone. The classic example is in the Georgian Defense Ministry where two baddies share an elevator chat and Sam must record the audio from the shadows. And that's just it. All of these little mechanics by themselves aren't anything uber fancy in today's world of gaming. But in 2002, these elements came together to give the feeling of being this elite covert operative, able to bend the environment to your will to progress as you saw fit. Even when the chips are down, you find a way.
take this clip for example. I come into this office complex, shoot out the security camera, and try this door. Realizing it's locked, I select the right tools and get to work. As I'm fishing through the tumblers, I hear another door opening on my right. Knowing I'm about to be caught, I work as fast as I can to pop the lock. As soon as I do, the alert music begins to play and I know I'm in combat now. Instead of quitting, I think fast and dip into the room, flipping the light switch off. Now the tables are turned and the enemy is entering my web. He runs in hastily and with his back turned, I deliver the Electronon sleeping pill. I make sure to turn the lights off again and hide the body in case his friends come snooping. Although this is one particular example, Splinter Cell is chock full of these little scenarios where quick thinking and calm decision making give the game its unique flavor. Admittedly, not everything is perfect. Let's get into it. What do you want? Aside from little visual quirks like those seen here, Splinter Cell doesn't suffer from any truly game-breaking bugs that I've ever encountered. These were the old days when you bought a game that didn't require a year of patches to be considered playable. The frustration with Splinter Cell lies within the heavy dose of trial and error. As mentioned previously, sometimes when your sneaky plans go awry, it can be fun to adapt to a kinetic situation on the fly. But, oftentimes the pain of this trial and error is illuminated by some questionable AI programming, some really dodgy climbing, mantling, and platforming controls, and third-person shooting mechanics that just plain suck! On AI programming, there's a level that takes place on an oil rig off Georgian waters in the Caspian Sea. American military jets are in short, bombing the place to shreds, and enemy foot soldiers are frantically running around in the chaos. The concept of infiltrating a well-lit environment surrounded by madness is actually really awesome in my opinion. As a matter of fact, several stages in Splinter Cell Double Agent, the fourth game in the series, are like this. And I know that Double Agent is kind of like the black sheep of the series, but I personally really enjoyed infiltrating active zones of combat. But on this oil rig, the execution is hampered by the aforementioned odd programming gaffes. In a more traditional, quiet, nighttime splinter cell level, it makes sense that your pounding footsteps would be audible to a guard in your vicinity. But at the GFO oil rig, where bombs and bullets are raining down everywhere, it's really goddamn stupid that someone would not only hear you briskly crouch walking, but to then ignore the all-out war taking place around them to investigate your footsteps. This extends to the spotty climbing and jumping mechanics. More often than not, these systems function as intended. Sometimes the iffy platforming is usually just mildly annoying and more comical than anything. But from time to time, this can lead to frustrating enemy alerts, mission failures, or deaths. For instance, on the bloody oil rig, you see this clearly highlighted in the introductory portion of the level. See, you need to gently leap onto this corner ledge, jump up onto this cross beam, and shimmy over. Okay, fine, whatever. But, first off, finding this spot is a pain in the hole. The welded ladders on these giant columns would lead one into thinking, ah yes, I obviously go up here. Then after several minutes of faffing about, you eventually end up on our precarious corner. Just make sure that when you jump, you land softly because, God forbid, you land with knees extended. The guards, all the way over on the catwalk, marching on metal grating in a war zone, can somehow hear that. Game over. Cool. 
but okay. We made it back. Ah, we've landed softly. But now, you run the risk of the mantling mechanics taking a dump, and you end up taking a dunk. Fuck around. Mission failure, and again, you have to watch this unskippable cutscene. Wow, people walking up some steps. Back to the corner with us. This isn't as prevalent as my other chief complaint with the original Splinter Cell, the shooting mechanics. To be fair, this is a stealth title first and foremost. And frankly, my favorite stealth action games are the ones that you can complete without killing a single person, like Dishonored. If you are to play a game where ending a life is an option or unavoidable, which happens a few times in this game, I prefer getting in nice, close, and quiet. Even in a game like Splinter Cell Chaos Theory, the third title in the series, where the shooting mechanics were significantly improved, I much preferred to sneak right on by or engage the enemy with my trusty combat knife to correct them, sir. But in the end, it's a video game and sometimes it's just fun to blast your way out of a sticky situation. And to that point, the shooting in this game is balls. It stinks. Even simple tasks like shooting out lights or cameras require Sam to pause, let the four-point aiming reticle shrink around the center sphere, and then shoot. Even with this patient, measured approach, your shots will often miss, causing you to waste precious ammo. Fighting human enemies armed with rifles with your little pea shooter is a massive pain in the nads. It just feels so stilted and mechanical. Sam just kind of has to crouch and pepper a bad dude until he prevails. You lose a ton of health and it takes several rounds to incapacitate someone, if you can even hit them. And look, I'm all for a splash of realism in games, and anyone that shoots pistols consistently can tell you that it's nowhere near as easy as using a long gun with a full length barrel. However, the real FN57 has relatively low recoil and allows for really fast follow-up shots. And the rounds travel at roughly 1800 feet per second with a 50 yard flat trajectory. However, I know that this isn't real. It's a video game. But a video game where you point guns at stuff shouldn't suck when it comes to pointing guns at stuff. Speaking of long guns, Sam's arsenal includes the SC-20K, a legally distinct F-2000 bullpup rifle, which just means the magazine is seated behind the trigger, chambered in 5.56. Whereas in the other titles in this series, where you have the SC-20K off the rip, in the first Splinter Cell, you don't acquire the weapon until you reach the fourth level, taking place inside of CIA headquarters at Langley. Not only is this the point in which you procured this new weapon, but you're sent into this level without even your sidearm, as you are under a strict no-kill policy. So, finally going hands-on with a rifle that fires special, non-lethal projectiles is great at first. The no-kill rule is still in effect, but bullets should always be your last resort anyway. The rifle can launch airfoil rings to stun or knock out an enemy, sticky shockers, which completely incapacitate a foe, sticky cameras for surveying your environment from a safe distance, Oh, hi, Mark. And distraction cameras that can lure enemies and knock them out with noxious fart gas. <laughs> Although the rifle's design is sleek and it would eventually, in later Splinter Cell games, be highly modifiable and really fun to use, shooting this thing in the original game is like launching yellow jackets out of a mini fridge. This usually isn't a massive problem when popping light bulbs and even sniping a still target is solid, but man, oh man, it sucks when you get into a shootout. You can alternate between semi-automatic and fully automatic. Okay, neat. 
But despite this being a rifle with a 16 inch barrel, Sam still has to crouch and hold still to take an accurate shot. Fully automatic fire is useless at any distance outside of kissing range. Just don't bother. Unless you love kissing. Yeah, you love kissing, don't you? Semi-automatic fire should be crisp and smooth, but nope. Just like using your sidearm, it's stiff, clunky, and oftentimes inexplicably inaccurate. With both firearms, I can land some pretty slick shots occasionally, but I always feel like I got kind of lucky, as opposed to being rewarded for mastering a skill. Anyway, as I just mentioned, going in guns blazing in a game so focused on sneaking isn't really the way the game was intended to be played anyway, so it's not a deal breaker, just a weaker element. And as we talked about earlier, sneaking in this game is the chef's kiss. For a game that took direct inspiration from Metal Gear Solid, the stealth mechanics in Splinter Cell really did propel it into a league unto itself. Visuals and user interface are great, but a stealth game, or situational awareness is key to success, wouldn't be anything without an expertly crafted audio design to prop it up. And oh baby do I love listening to the sweet sounds of Splinter Cell 1. Goody. Composed by Michael Richard Plowman, Splinter Cell's soundtrack is a still blend of understated atmospheric electronic melodies, punctuated by hypnotic vocal chants, and supported by an orchestral symphony that is admittedly forgettable. It sounds nice when you hear it, but it's not as memorable as, say, Jesper Kidd's work. The soundtrack is subtle, which, for a game about being a totally anonymous sneaky man, is appropriate. This leaves room for the Foley work and the voice acting to breathe. Each sound is distinct. The sound of the night vision goggles isn't real, but it gives Sam's trademark look a trademark sound. Sam himself is voiced by the one and only Michael Ironside. Ironside is perfectly cast in this role and brings Sam Fisher to life with a mix of wise-ass acerbic wit and dead serious growling threats as he interrogates enemies. One false move and you're dead. I need information. Um, okay. I'm looking for two Americans. Probably dead. I... Gringo will kill me! Duh! Where are they? Sam's a very frightened guy. You know, that's why he sort of walks in and does stuff like, Hi, I'm gonna kill you. Because if you're a happy guy, you come in and go, Hi, I'm gonna kill you. Stay quiet. You don't want your life to end in the boys' room. I want you to answer some questions. I love that he's not a servant, he's not a drone. He has his own opinions, and he's not afraid to put allies in their place either. And my condolences for Lieutenant Wilkes. I understand he was a good man. I'll find you when the job's done. I do hope we'll get along. Your profile at the fort said you wouldn't have trouble working with a woman. It doesn't worry me. Don't bring up Wilkes again. Uh, sure. Sure. Good luck. By the time we reach the fifth game in the series, Splinter Cell Conviction, Sam is downright mean, with most of the joking left behind. Throughout the entire series, however, Sam is always softer when conversing with his daughter, Sarah. He could be in an aircraft on his way to assassinate a genocidal madman, but he always makes time to calmly and politely address the fruits of his loins. Sometimes, Sam makes interesting noises. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Ah. Ooh. Oh, yeah. 
but it's not as weird as some of the things that Solid Snake has said over the years, so there's that. Not only that, but several pounds of muff are reported every year. Muff. Onto the supporting cast, we have Irving Lambert, voiced by Don Jordan, who is an exemplary counterpart to Sam Fisher. It's subtly established that Sam and Lambert have a long history, but they never become sappy or buddy-buddy during the campaign. Lambert is in charge, and Sam is the operator. Both know their role and what they must do to accomplish the mission. And Lambert is not afraid to pull the leash if Sam is letting emotion get in the way of that. Their relationship is further established as the series goes on, but I suppose that'll be for another day. Remaining characters like Grimm's daughter and Junior Wilkes round out the cast, each with a distinct voice and unique personality. On a side note, the audio quality in the original Splinter Cell is really crisp. The only reason I bring that up is because in the sequel, Pandora Tomorrow, a lot of the dialogue from enemy NPCs sounds really fuzzy and crummy. I don't know what happened there, but again, another day. Thank God, I thought he would never go away. Is that a joke? Yes, I'm putting a plot synopsis at the end of a video. This won't be a regular feature in the future. The thing is, the plot is just kind of boring. Sam Fisher is a former US Navy SEAL officer that joined the NSA and their super sneaky new program, Third Echelon. The government denies them, blah blah blah. Sam's investigating the disappearance of two missing CIA officers. It turns out they've been killed after they discover that the new Georgian president, Kombay Nikolaids, had been heading an ethnic cleansing campaign across the Republic of Azerbaijan. Solid concept, and I do enjoy a world-spanning grand conspiracy involving the psychos of the planet and the good guys who work in secret to stop them. As slick and intriguing as the plot comes off in a brief synopsis, the way the tale is told is bland and pretty forgettable. In stark contrast to real-time gameplay, cutscenes usually look like Baho. They're super brief and they usually take place from within the Osprey aircraft. Splinter Cell was greatly inspired by, but in direct competition with, the Metal Gear Solid series, the big daddy of stealth action games. In direct opposition to Metal Gear Solid's gigantic cinematic presentation being at the forefront of those titles, Splinter Cell opted for quick hits of exposition and storytelling. And as much as I love Sam Fisher as a character, if it wasn't for Michael Ironside's performance, I probably wouldn't. Hi, I'm gonna kill you. The guy really does make that character. That's why the generic dude bro they got to voice Sam in Splinter Cell Blacklist, the last major title released in the series, was completely and totally forgettable. Ironside brings a genuine gravitas to Sam's dialogue that gives the fiction some weight and credibility. Metal Gear has its hordes of detractors, and I get it. Not everyone appreciates the long, long scenes and the admittedly ridiculous story. However, I could easily list 10 characters from Metal Gear that I loved dearly, and the reasons why. They're just so memorable. I mean, Jesus Christ, just Google the sorrow from Metal Gear 3 and you'll see what I mean. With Splinter Cell, former Soviet bad guys are psychos that want to do bad stuff, the Chinese are involved, and the sneaky team of sneakies is going to stop them. A support character dies about a third of the way through the game, and it has nearly zero emotional impact. It happens suddenly in a goofy cutscene and passes like gas in the breeze. The only reason I knew his name is because I've played this game so many times. The overall plot is just kind of eh. And that's why I wanted to save this summary until the end of the video. I didn't want to cast a shadow over the game from the outset, especially if you're new to the series. I didn't want to give the wrong impression. Because this isn't the point of Splinter Cell. Even though the characters would certainly become more meaningful in later games, which is a check in the win column for Splinter Cell Double Agent, 
In the original, the plot is not nearly as important as everything else I've discussed in the video preceding this section. And that leads us to the final topic. What more can I say? Splinter Cell is a monumental achievement in gaming. It won several Game of the Year awards when that used to really mean something. It garnered a 93% on Metacritic. It sold at least over 6 million copies. And who knows how many used, untracked copies that have been passed around over the years. The Xbox, like all major business ventures, was a potential financial disaster waiting to happen for Microsoft. Games like Splinter Cell are one of the major reasons why the console not only succeeded in its infancy, but one of the reasons why the Xbox is still one of the three major gaming brands globally. But to me, personally, Splinter Cell holds a very special place in my heart. Not only is it just a purely fun video game to play even after all these years, and really, it truly was a joy to play through this game again for this retrospective. But the association I make with this title is one of a simpler time. It reminds me of spending time with my little brother. It reminds me of friends who I no longer know. It reminds me of being a kid. This was before the crazy years of high school and smoking bud and chasing girlies and driving cars and playing in bar bands and all the way on to these so-called grown man years of getting married, graduating college, having kids, and eking out a career. I have grown-up fears, too. I fear finding lumps, my eyes well with tears when I imagine helping my dogs cross the rainbow bridge. I hope my car makes it another day. COVID, riots, inflation, I mean, Jesus Christ. Adulting, right? The days of the original Splinter Cell were before all that. It was in my last dwindling days of innocence, where the only worry was writing notes to your crush, riding your bike, sipping soda, holding on to your CD player just right to avoid skipping the disc. As difficult as it may be sometimes, I'm very grateful for these years. Not everyone I knew from this era is around to enjoy them. As I sneak my way through the levels of Splinter Cell 20 years later, I remember that time. I'll hold those days and those memories close to me. Forever. And there's the tea bag. One more question, Sam. What about the rumors there is a sequel in the works? Have you signed on for Splinter Cell 2? Unfortunately, I'm not authorized to discuss those matters at this time. 